Welcome to this episode of Sitecore in 300 Seconds Plus. My name is Evan. I work as a consultant at Sitecore. And in this episode, I'm going to provide a deeper insight into decision management with Sitecore and showcase how it works. If you're interested in a shorter overview, please watch my 300 Seconds episode. Decision modeling is an important consideration for business and marketing professionals hoping to have a rich and engaging experiences with their customers. Decision modeling is an important consideration for businesses and marketing professionals hoping to have a rich engagement with their customers. Decisions behind personalization, decisions to help ensure regulatory compliance, and decisions to help guide customers with next best actions, urgency messaging, recommendations, cross-selling and upselling, all need to be modeled and available through all interactions with your business. To manage our decisions effectively and to meet customer and business expectations, we need to consider some common issues that can occur with decision modeling. Firstly, how do we make sure these decisions are delivered consistently across all of our different channels and touch points? We also need to consider the cost of repeating implementation across all channels. How can we minimize duplicated effort and errors that can arise from this? In addition, we need to think about collaboration. How do all the internal stakeholders and implementation experts collaborate together to model these decisions and then build and maintain them as the businesses grow and change? Today, I'll be discussing how this can be achieved. I'll give an illustration of how decisions can and should be managed. Then I'll show exactly how this can be achieved with Sitecore by orchestrating decision data, building a decision table, enriching decisions with an external data source, and then safely deploying them for use across all of your channels. To begin with, let's talk about decision management as a whole. I'm gonna discuss the importance of codifying your business decisions centrally, how decisions can be distributed across your channels, and why we need to be able to easily change and manage decisions. When working with organizations, we regularly see a common problem arise when managing and modeling decisions. Firstly, business initiatives often start with conceptual rules or guidelines. In the case of personalization, this might describe what type of a customer should have what type of experience. It might be guidelines that need to be met for regulatory compliance. It might describe what types of conversations customer service representatives should have with customers at certain life cycle stages. It may even be about how we can guide a customer along a journey to meet a specific business goal. To make these concepts a reality, many internal stakeholders need to collaborate. We need business or marketing leaders to conceptualize the initiative, development experts to implement the idea, legal teams to ensure compliance, and product people to align it with a roadmap. These teams must interpret the rules and regulations and decisions and ensure they are communicated to the customer in the appropriate way, regardless of how that customer chooses to interact. Perhaps on the website, a mobile app, maybe with a customer service representative or in person through a branch or point of sale. They may even be interacting through a piece of API enabled technology. So to do this, internal stakeholders must collaborate and codify these ideas. For example, the stakeholders may meet to discuss how this is implemented on web. They'll collaborate, codify the rules, and have them distributed on the website channel. Perhaps these same stakeholders will uh, decide how the rules will be interpreted and implemented across mobile. When looking at a different channel, however, we might have a different set of stakeholders collaborating and codifying these rules. Perhaps a different set of stakeholders may operate over branches and across APIs. And this is where issues can often occur. Perhaps the implementation that happened on web and mobile, even though it came from the same stakeholders, was codified and implemented just slightly differently. If that's the case, we'll get inconsistencies across those channels. In the case that we have different sets of internal stakeholders collaborating, such as with your CSR and web channels, we may even find that there is an inconsistency in the way the rules were interpreted in which case we may see an inconsistency in one or more of those channels. Now, this is after the initial implementation. We are already seeing areas where issues and maybe even a breach can occur. But when we consider the next iteration of changes, 
these inconsistencies, these issues will continue and they will be amplified and they'll impact all channels. We know modern businesses need to be agile and change quickly and effectively. So we need to plan for this type of iteration. Now let's see what this might look like if we were managing the decisions centrally. First of all, all of our internal stakeholders would be collaborating in the same location. This would mitigate the risk of having differences in interpretation and implementation. As new stakeholders provide input, all the rules are updated and consistent across all of your channels. Having this single place for the codification of product personalization and regulatory rules now means that we can distribute it evenly across channels, ensuring consistency there as well. This means that as our businesses learn, change and adapt, we can be sure that it only ever happens one time consistently across all channels, mitigating any inconsistencies, lowering the cost of implementation and reducing human error. We've seen that managing your business decisions centrally is important to improve consistency across channels, reduce human error, and lower the cost of implementation and maintenance. But how exactly is this achieved with Sitecore technology? To start with, let's look at the first step of effective decision management, how we can orchestrate data to be used in a decision. In today's example, we'll be modeling a decision to promote next best insurance products to different types of customers. Today, I'll be showing Sitecore's decision canvas how we can drag and drop data elements to orchestrate and enrich decisions. And finally, how we can manipulate data using programmable elements. We find that when business rules are conceived and created, a great first step is to workshop the design with both business and technical stakeholders. This often takes place with a physical or virtual whiteboard, allowing us to map out what data is needed, where it should come from, and how it should be manipulated to make smart decisions. This is Sitecore's decision canvas, and it has been created with this style of decision modeling in mind. This is where business and technical users collaborate to model decisions that can be used in any channel. On this canvas, we need to describe what data we need to make a decision, where it should come from, and what operations should happen. To do this, we can drag and drop elements from the right-hand panel. Business and technical users have easy access to your zero and first party customer data. This includes guest data, information about their most recent orders and behavioral session data, all available in real time. We also have access to functions such as decision tables and programmable nodes and other data sources such as external systems and trained AI models. We'll be touching on all of these features in this video. As a first simple example, if you wanted to send an offer to customers who live in Victoria, who have been recently viewing boating equipment, we may take some zero party data from the guest node, some behavioral data from the session node, add a decision table and send the data up. Let's take a detailed look at a more realistic and sophisticated example of a decision canvas. In this example, an insurance company would like to offer the right type of insurance to a customer at the right time. If they're interested in houses, maybe we should offer them home and contents insurance. If they have a high propensity to purchase travel insurance, we can help there too. The decision canvas follows the decision model notation standard. And with this standard, it's recommended to read from the bottom up. So let's start there. Here we have access to information about our customers. As I mentioned, we can leverage zero and first party customer data, including what they've been doing in that session, what we know about them as a guest, and the information that we have on what they have ordered. Again, all of this is accessible in real time. Moving up the canvas, we can see in this example that some programmable elements have been used to help manipulate the customer data to make it easier for business users to access. This is a great example of collaboration between technical and non-technical users. A simple example might be to programmatically determine a user's age from their known date of birth. Editing the node shows us that we can use JavaScript to make the simple manipulation. And this is now ready to be used in a decision. 
Other examples of programmable nodes includes highlighting recently viewed products from the session data, uh, products that have been purchased from order data. We can add even more complex logic, like highlighting product propensities for products that haven't yet been purchased. In the first node, we are selecting only viewed products from the session data, product propensities from the guest node, and purchase products from the order node. We have another step that helps us determine what the customer has currently not purchased that they might purchase according to their predetermined propensities. The final step at the top is a decision table. We'll be looking at this in detail in the next part of the demonstration, but essentially this is where we can start to define the rules for the information that we have collected. We've just seen how we can orchestrate data required for business decisions to a drag and drop interface. In this way, we can activate your company's unique first party customer data to consistently deliver business decision outcomes for all channels. Now that we've orchestrated the information on a decision canvas, we can start setting up our rules. In this section, we'll be taking a closer look at a decision table to see exactly how this is done. You'll see how we can execute rules one line at a time, adding input and output columns, and how we can set up a hit policy to describe how these items will be evaluated. Okay, now that the business and technical users have orchestrated the data, we can start setting up individual rules to offer appropriate insurance products to our customers. Let's click on the table and see what has been set up. The first thing you'll notice are rows and columns. The first columns here describe the data we have flowing in from the canvas. The first column represents the product that was most recently viewed by the customer. The second is the product they have the highest propensity to purchase. And the third column is the customer's age. The following two columns are outputs. Specifically, the two insurance products we think would be the next best fit for our customer. In this case, these are next best products, but we often see these decision tables used to model next best actions, next best conversations, personalization treatments, urgency messaging, and much more. The rows in the table represent individual rules. These rules are assessed one at a time. The first rule says, if this person recently viewed home insurance, I don't mind what the product propensity says, or the age of the customer, let's have a conversation around home insurance as a priority and mortgage protection secondarily. Moving down to rule number four, it says that regardless of the products you've recently viewed, if we've determined you have a propensity to purchase car insurance and you're under 31, we'll prioritize car insurance conversations followed by travel insurance. Now, these rules are evaluated one at a time, but we also have control over how they are assessed with a hit policy. Every decision table has a hit policy. A decision table's hit policy determines how many rules can be simultaneously satisfied as a means of selecting the appropriate output. In this case, the insurance next best action. There are two categories of hit policy, single hit policies and multiple hit policies. A single hit policy will allow only one output to be returned. A multiple hit policy will cover many rules where the criteria is met. In this case, we only want to return one set of recommendations, so we'll leave it as a single hit. We can add new columns and new rules to this table through the user interface using the add column button and the add rule link. I'm going to show you exactly how we do this in an upcoming section. We have just seen that with our first party customer data consolidated and orchestrated, we can easily create rules that are simple to understand and change, but with enough flexibility to power business decisions feeding into next best actions, personalization treatments, urgency messaging, and more. And now that we've seen the basics of orchestrating data and setting up rules, Let's see how we can enrich the decision with an external data source. In this example, we'll create a connection to an external source. We'll drag the connection into the decision canvas 
and we'll include the connection output in our decision table by adding columns and adding rules. Okay, I'd like to make a change to this decision that we've just modeled. At this insurance company, a risk threshold changes regularly. I should find out our company's risk threshold in real time. And if that has been exceeded, I should suppress any next best conversation. To do that, I'll need to get access to the risk data in real time. This same technique can be used to connect to fast moving data from internal data sources like inventory or availability, or it can call out to a source external to your organization like government or weather. Luckily for me, I do have access to an API that has this information. Here's the payload that it returns. It looks like my company's risk threshold is currently at a level seven, but can change any time. Let's see how we can leverage this data in our decision. The first thing I need to do is navigate to the connection setup wizard and select add connection. Today, I'll be adding a connection to the risk threshold system. This same wizard is used to set up connections to activate any of your trained models through the AI options. You can easily use those models or outputs that your data scientists have created here. We can also connect to a destination, which allows us to easily send data out to external systems like a marketing automation tool. For now, I'll select data systems to connect to our internal API. Now I'll give this a meaningful name and a description and select an icon to help us easily identify it. When setting up a connection, we can also honor required authentication methods, such as OAuth2, basic authentication, or connect with no security. There's no security on this endpoint, so I'll move ahead with that. Now I'll paste the URL of the risk endpoint and test the connection. We can see that the up-to-date information is being returned in the payload. It looks good to me, so let's navigate to the next screen. Here we can see the response payload has been parsed with reference types automatically being detected. The risk type has been detected as a string. That's great. It means we can start acting on this data easily. Finally, I can review the setup and hit save and my connection is now ready to be used. Navigating back to my decision model, I'd now like to use my new risk threshold data source. To do that, I'll take a look at the toolbox on the right-hand side and drag a systems node onto the canvas. I'll now search for my risk node and select it to make it available with the rest of my orchestrated data. I'll now let my decision table know that I'd like to use this in addition to other data points I've set up. So I'll point the new risk data source to the decision table. Okay, finally, let's update the decision table to make use of that new data. Let's select the decision table to model the next best offer for the insurance products. Here we can see that the three input columns that correspond to the data points orchestrated on the decision canvas. We need to create a new column to take advantage of the new risk API call. I'll select add column. I'll call this risk threshold and for the input I need to select the appropriate field from the connection. As I start typing, you'll see autocomplete recommending fields that I can choose based on what's available in the connection that we'd set up. Now we need to be able to add a new rule. I think this rule should say, regardless of what a customer has been viewing, their product propensities and age, if the threshold is at a maximum, we should suppress the next best action. So I'll add a new rule and add the risk threshold. Now, according to our HIP policy, the first HIP rule will be selected. I think this is a high importance, so I'll move this to be evaluated first. And as easy as that, we have added a brand new column and rule to be evaluated of an external data source in real time.
Enriching a decision model with any fast moving data from an external data source can be done quickly and easily through the connection wizard. And just like all the changes we made in the decision canvas, it's ready to be used in any channel. Our decision model is looking really good now. And I think I'd like to safely release it into production. This final step in decision management is important. We need to ensure that our model decisions can be deployed easily and predictably, ready for omni-channel use. To do this, let's take a look at moving a draft decision model into a silent test, moving a model from test to production, and then creating new versions of our decision model after it's gone live. Firstly, I'll save the insurance next best action that we've modeled today and close the canvas down. Now we can see the stages that we can progress through to move a model through to production. Models always begin in draft, and you can see the variant we have been working on today. We can also see there's a version of this model in production. So let's roll this change out and replace that model now. The first stage is to move the model from draft to test to start a silent test. A silent test means that the model is being executed in experiences that include this decision model, and we are logging interactions and operations for reporting purposes, but the customer is unaffected. This is a very important step because it gives us confidence that the model will behave as expected in production. If this decision is related to mission critical business functions or for regulatory compliance, this step is essential. Results from the silent test are easily accessible through the view results link. Once we are happy with our silent test, we can move the test into production. Another important feature to note is that when we moved the model into production with another model, the new model appears with no audience set. This is another safety feature. We need to explicitly set the percentage of the audience that this model will be rolled out to. The pilot group can be changed by selecting configure and adjusting the percentage in the interface. Once we are happy that the model is running appropriately in production, we can move a variant to archive. A final point to note, when a variant of a decision model is in production, it's immutable. It can't be changed. This is to ensure our reporting and behavior is predictable. If we'd like to make a change to a variant that's in production, we would need to clone it back into a draft. To do this, we select add variant in the draft column, and we select the version we would like to update. And now we are ready to go and start our next iteration. We've just seen how we can make changes to decisions that we have modeled safely and predictably directly in the tool. This helps make sure your customers are having a great consistent experience, regardless of how they interact with your business. Today, we had a closer look at managing decisions effectively. We saw the importance of managing decisions centrally to minimize inconsistency across channels. We saw how business and technical users can collaborate to orchestrate data and easily understand rules. We enriched a decision model with fast moving risk data. The same principles apply to any data in your tech ecosystem. And finally, we saw how we can deploy this change safely and predictably. With Sitecore, we can manage decisions effectively across all your channels. You can centralize your decisions to be delivered consistently across all your different channels and touch points. You can lower the cost of implementation across channels too by reducing duplicated codification and reducing errors. And during the process, promote easy collaboration to build and change decisions in your business. Thank you for watching this episode of Sitecore in 300 seconds plus. I hope this has given you insight into how we can deliver effective decisions with Sitecore and what benefits that can bring to your business.